So the legend of Neil, I've told this story many times, uh, it started with some drunkenness. My roommate was playing Zelda, and then I started just kind of cracking jokes. Who is this old man in a cave, and why is he giving you a wooden sword to defeat evil creatures that shoot stones out of their faces? This thing's a piece of crap. Hey, fuck you. That crap is free. I made it. What if this is just a regular dude who gets sucked into the game? And then I just thought of the most mundane name, no offense to Neil's out there. I wrote that sketch that night. There was a lot of spelling errors because I was really drunk. I thought it was really, really funny because it was, it was off such a classic that I had played so much as a kid. I could picture the game. I was laughing at all the inside jokes about the game. We understood how to shoot for 500 bucks, 600 bucks out of our pocket. We both just kind of pulled our cash. We had two days of shooting, one outside in the woods where we kind of guerrilla styled it. Naked. and me Great. naked under a shield and us kind of trying to hide from oh, people as they walked man. by. So we ended up posting and the show on YouTube, checking my email at one point, and it was just completely full of YouTube emails. And I was like, what's this website that's sending me all these spam emails? And then I realized, no, these aren't spam emails. These are people subscribing to my channel. The comment over and over again was more. When I found out that we were going to be able to do a full season because Adam and Comedy Central came on. I was doing customer service for a fitness company. Instinctively, I wanted to quit my job right there, but then I was reminded that this was a web show and that probably wouldn't be a good idea. I've been in every room, gone everywhere that show me except that. What the fuck is that? When using the map, you should use all of it. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe these are your favorite parts, but this is important too. Creating that world was a big challenge, was the biggest challenge trying to figure out how to make the best possible product with the least amount of money. If you gave that budget to someone like J.J. Abrams and said, make a series that's going to attract hundreds of thousands of people to watch, dude wouldn't even know what to do. So all these people would just come in like at the right time, and it was really because of them that we were able to pull off what we were able to pull off. I tried to create a lighting design based on a 1980s video game called Dragon's Lair. And it reminded me of The Legend of Zelda in the sense they were both in dungeons and they were both magical. That gave me an idea for a three-dimensional view of what that lighting design could look like. A buddy of Sundeep's apartment is what we turned into the cave. And we had his ping pong table up on wheels covered in paper bags that we were able to flip the wall uh, by reversing wherever we put that so we could do both angles with the old man and Neil. We've got Boomerang! We really focused on the original Zelda, and then we it was taking these 8-bit creatures and giving them attitudes and wants and desires. The dragon doesn't talk, doesn't do anything in the game but shoot fireballs, which means its personality was totally up to uh, so Sandeep and I to come up with. My dad beat me a, a ton! It's not your fault, man. It's not your fault. Shut up! It's not your fault. I'm a big fantasy nerd, so while I wasn't familiar with the specifics of Hyrule, pretty comfortable with Elves and swords and shields. Leah Mann worked tirelessly. She was just so interested in creating the, the look and the worlds, and she put so much thought and effort into it. I was really lucky to find a few people who are extremely knowledgeable and talented and work really hard. I don't think at that point I had done a lot of comedy. For the most part, I do a lot of horror. But yeah, my process was the same. You look at the character, you break down the character, figure out what that character needs. You know, every time we needed something, she would exceed our expectations. I think that people kind of lump in their heads costuming with maybe makeup and art department, but it's really a unique thing. The cool thing about Jenny is that she really wanted to make distinct costumes. Because we use the first Zelda, we have these eight-bit dots that I get to kind of be like, oh, this is what they look like. Of course, this is what they look like. She was building costumes up until the last minute. On the day that we were shooting the Armos, we were like literally painting the costumes onto the Sklar Brothers. Why are you dropping them on level one and not seven or eight, where the bad guys are much tougher to get through? I mean, you know, it seems like we can get rid of this. Guy. <laughs>
Your insolent logic angers Ganon. Okay, uh, that's fine. Duly noted. It's just that I... Oh, do you think I like having to hit you? If, like, your actor Sorry, is just inherently good, the audience will go along with it. Let's go man to beast. No weapons, no magic. Well, you don't have any weapons or magic, so why would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, originally Ganon was always gonna be just a claw, and maybe we thought down the line, maybe we'd show him, but we definitely accelerated that once we saw how funny Scott was. You know what that is? That is smart. I did my part for the entire first season of Legend of Neil in one night. Yeah. Because I recorded all my lines, and I just sat there with the glove on trying to gesticulate as much as I could. We actually cast Eric Acosta as the Octorok. Oh! Took a character that was virtually mute and made him hilarious. And then he kept assuring me, like, don't, like, down the road, we have this other character in mind for you to play. And, and at first I was like, no, no, you don't. Have you ever had sex with a woman? I think so. Zelda was another interesting challenge. You barely saw her in the game. We don't know what race she necessarily is. You're black? Yeah. Is, is that a problem? They went all the way into the mountains to make it look real, and uh, immediately I just jumped right into the world and thought, all right, here we are. Oh. Uh, yeah. Greetings, Link. We just thought it was kind of funny, the idea that the fairy heals you, and there's hearts flying around you. So, in my head, well, what if that means they're making love? I'm gonna suck your toes. I can't imagine why he was inspired to write that part for me. Will you like it when I motorboat him? The fairy character is unlike all the other stuff she does. It's really raunchy. Uh, uh. When I first met Felicia improvising, I saw this adorable girl on stage saying the naughtiest, nastiest shit. Um, anywho. Uh, so you're leaving, just like you said you wouldn't. Yeah, being suspended on a wire by your groin area is not exactly easy. She literally told me that I think my vagina is gonna fall off. The centrifugal force makes you spin, right? So whenever you go, hey guys, then you'd go, and I'd just go in a circle like I couldn't stop. Now, I kept not casting myself in roles. I wanted to play old man, I wanted to play the storekeeper, um, and then I kept finding better people to, to suit those roles. But I didn't want to have my sort of acting stamp on it in some ways, so I ended up doing the German skeletons with Tony. They just become more, for, more fun loving and riffy and just, uh, you know, hey, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's, make, let's make a good deal here. Oh, I love deals. Oh yeah, I'm gay for deals. Deals. Tony, he's just someone you can rely on. And when you have an actor that is in every scene and practically every shot, you need that person. He's not waka waka like big about it. He's like very internal and subtle and that like sells the joke so much better than trying to like, hey, wasn't I just funny guys? Hey, anybody watching? Tony is just like the perfect leading man for this because he's funny and he's able to carry off that kind of tough guy, sort of reluctant action hero role. Ah uh, yes, the magic delicious heart cookie. Eat up. You deserve it after committing murder. To create old man and his, you know, his persona and, and the voice, it sort of came from a person I knew who uh, had this voice and he had like a jutted out lower jaw. And then I, there was this other old man I encountered when I was waiting tables. Everything was like, what? Everything annoyed him. Everything bothered him. Mike Rose is the most brilliant improviser maybe I've ever worked with. I describe my penis as a snake in the beginning, then later on as a rib. I always say about improv, like, I'm not even present when I'm doing it. And then and then later on, I'm like, oh, I said that. Tony and Cindy have such a strong background in improv. You could tell when you read the scenes that they came from an improv place, and then they, like, refine them to be scripted. Kill, I like that word. Oh, that reminds me. <laughs> oh, that rem Kill, that reminds oh, that reminds me. <laughs> we let those takes roll and roll until the crew couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> have him killed. See what I did there? Yeah, no, no, I saw that. That was clever. You might want to have the other one killed too, just for symmetry's sake. They took every Ganon and Wizrobe scene and, and made it much funnier than it was. In one take, I decided to deliver this kind of joke about Manhandla, just sort of like doing some hacky bit. And you just completely improv this line like, don't work out your stand up comedy on my time. I want to see a fully developed act <laughs> or nothing at all. And it was just such a great moment. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved criticizing your stand up comedy. 
Oh, I'm starting to get the first of my three bonus. Why do you guys have three, you know what, no. I we were pumped to write season two. Now you're catering to an audience base and you really got these characters down. So what the F, Link? Why haven't you defeated any other levels? For season two, we had a standing set, but we would have to go from, say, the pub to a cave. And being able to flip everything over without putting everybody else behind schedule was tough. Completely transform a wall of paper from this wall of paper to a wall of paper on a different side of Hyrule. It took a lot of work with the lighting. When we got that money from Comedy Central, I realized I think we can pull this off. And then Tony and Cindy come back with like, oh yeah, just so you know, we've added a musical episode. The first thought was, holy crap, like, this is really ambitious. And then it was like, holy crap, this is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm at the end of level two, but I'm not sure what to do. I came to me with the idea of doing a musical. I was thrilled and also like, how the hell do you write a musical? So uh, certainly I'd never done it before, but I guess I was his best option, AKA free option. <laughs> We sat around a piano with him, not having the slightest idea what the hell we were doing. I don't think this responsibility. Tony started drafting out some shitty, vomity lyrics. Instead of just Obi-Wan, you've got Obi-2. Long nights of trying to make lyrics that worked, we got finally these kind of bass songs, and we knew that we wanted the old man song to be riff off of Aladdin. I knew we wanted the finale to incorporate all the pieces of the other songs. This is a da -na -na, da -na 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 -na. So Wizard Rope can do that, uh, and then you can put. We're swimming some laps in a pool of Link Sea. No we knew we wanted to end with something that would have a chord progression, and so it was something that I had in mind for all, all of the other songs. There's no restart. I was totally blown away. I mean, that episode to me will always be the highlight of my whole Legend of Null experience. There was the obvious desire to raise the stakes a little bit, take the show a little bit splashier, a little bit larger. Greg Ronowitz is a huge part of how Neil took a big step. He's a man who can make something out of nothing. This dude has a Steven Spielberg recommendation letter hanging from his wall. The thing about Legend of Neo was that there were a lot of conscious choices made in the beginning by Sandeep and by Leah about the style of the show. They had to create an entire world with nothing. And it was definitely challenging to figure out how to elevate everything but not lose the charm. A lot of people ask me, why are you doing web series? It just seemed really exciting. It was like the Wild West. A lot of working on Neo was just the two of us. Um, so, you know, we'd just be sitting around, coming up with ideas. We didn't have a guy like Greg and Brian Falk and all these other people who were able to produce such high quality material in such a short time and on such a small budget, then season three isn't as epic. Yeah, we've seen that. We've seen that, Captain. The dance off. One of the brilliant moves by Greg Ronowitz was designing three different bodies. Each different frame allowed Robert Hoffman to do different types of dance moves. The cardboard one would stay in its form, but allow him to move it around. The ragdoll type frame would let him pretty much do anything. Then the welded metal frame would support his weight so he could essentially like rear up on it. <laughs> the family scene was insanely challenging for everybody to try to pull it off. We're doing some Tony was like, oh, I want to play more characters, oh, blah, blah, blah. I want to be Eddie Murphy. And so we have to turn him from being just Neil into fucking the dad, and he wanted to play the mom, which makes no sense. But the dad and mom were basically identical twins. I'm actually proud about you, Neil, about everything. Except them silly gay heart tattoos. Those are pretty queer tastic, man. You, you talking about these tattoos? Mm. It took me three months to grow that mustache. Okay. And then Fair. Sandeep wanted me to shave it, knowing that I had to go back and film Daryl's stuff. And he was like, no, we'll just put a fake one on. I was like, no, this is what this guy's about. So then we were just like, fuck it, we'll just gray it up. And it, I think it was perfect, because like everybody has Tony, Grandma, and Daryl have these dirty mustaches. What's better, being a producer or being a dark nut? With him, you just get this full range of resources that I just had to 
tap as much as humanly possible. I did get involved uh, not only behind the scenes, but in front of the camera a lot. We would always throw him in costumes that we needed in the background, and he was always willing to show us his ass. I didn't realize that I would be having to bear my ass as much as I did. You're going to be OK. Let it out. Let it all out. <laughs> One thing that was really fun to do was all the force perspective stuff that we did for the, uh, the Armos sequences. Some people said that he wanted, you know, these Armos to be the thing of these huge rock people. Through kind of a clever design of the camera angles, kind of design a shot so that nothing has to be done in post. This fucking audible on me! I hope I'm pregnant. I'm late, you know. Yeah, you're about to have a whole lot of mouths to feed because fairies have litter. The idea of these, the being pregnant and like that twist was so funny. And then I didn't even know until I got on set they were they were gonna put my face on the babies, me and Tony. That might have been one of the more awkward moments was putting red gum in your mouth and then having Sundeep stand behind the camera and telling you to act like a baby. And for the amount of footage we have of us acting like stupid babies, there's maybe eight seconds of screen time. <laughs> this was too easy. Yeah, you know, nothing is going to make me feel better than the finale. I really feel like we accomplished something with that episode. Spectral Rock is an entrance to death. So one of the things that Tony and I wrote that was like, how the fuck are we going to do this? Neil falling in through the ceiling of level nine. It's just one of those VFX things that I'm really proud of. And we actually built the miniature cliff with Greg. And that was cool. It was really like kind of getting your hands dirty and sort of experiencing what those art guys go through. Getting to improvise with Mike and getting to finally act with him in that climactic scene was, I was looking forward to it so much. Hello, friend. There's just lots of pretending, you know, some sort of stream of laser or powers coming out of my hands. Come get some. I never directed a kung fu scene before in my life. I've always wanted to. <laughs> we were lucky enough to get Fernie Chen and Sifu Todd to choreograph that for us and end up being those doubles. So we had to do what was called a pre-visualization. Not in costume, not or anything, just shooting the choreography and cutting it so that you get a basic idea of what you're gonna get in the final product. All right, three, one, two, two, but don't shift, keep uh, right leg forward, right leg forward, don't shift. Okay, one, two, three, one. Uh, okay, perfect. I worked out with Tony going through the hand techniques and he had it down. You see the stunt doubles and then you see Tony actually do the, the Wing Chun hand techniques. Down, down, left, right. I didn't want to slow them down and, and be the douchey actor that is crappy at, you know, pretending he knows how to fight. We had to get so much coverage. We got so much coverage. We had three cameras shooting at once. Um, we broke the scene down into various parts, and that was one of those times where in post-production, I looked at our footage and I was like, oh, I think I failed. <laughs> Little did I recognize how valuable sound effects and visual effects, and all, you'd think that at this point, episode seven of the third season, I would understand these things. The biggest obstacle is trying to find locations for the money that we have. It was a church that they transformed. There was a million pews in there, and there was a lot of work that we had to do. It looked like a huge budget movie. I was impressed how amazing the set looked. I guess I remember most from building that set was the really, really high back wall. It was probably 30 or 40 feet high. And I think we had some stuff attached outward with ropes, holding the walls, which were a little floppy. He looks a little bit Asian. It was probably challenging for you to become that Asian person in that scene. That, that was, was that was, that I had to really dig deep. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, this really isn't so bad. So post-production, really can go fuck itself. Uh, and it's a hard, hard, hard job. And so thank God for Josh and Tony. The scripts that are written and the footage that you get are two totally different things in a lot of ways. And like the funniest moments, you don't, you don't know what those are gonna be. Because then you're gonna be all clingy because I was here first. Some of the funniest scenes that I think have come out of the series were, were the moments where we really just found ourselves trying to make each other laugh. <laughs> Post-production for each season got more and more complicated. 
and you have to get used to seeing a shot that doesn't have the right color yet and doesn't have the FX and doesn't have the sound effects. And you kind of have to get over panicking that this isn't going to work. A lot of times um, an effect doesn't look like it's going to work out until I get to it in the computer and I see the actual pixels to manipulate how it's supposed to look. One of the biggest challenges was the musical episode where the fairies were in the jars. I'd never really done that before as far as putting things behind glass. We can still be BFFs. We'll be the most powerful BFF I rule has ever seen. So there was a shot in season three when Ganon was fighting Old Man where they were sort of locked in this energy beam back and forth. I probably took two or three days just to do that shot. I counted probably 350 effects in just that episode alone. I think that was about how many effects were in season two, the entire season. In episode 305 and 306, there was this graveyard scene. They wanted to light it kind of like this purplish blue for a lot of dark moodiness, but the problem was that the uh, like a purple gel is almost a black gel, so it would just knock down all of the lights. They lit it with a really strong color, which was yellow in this case, and then in coloring, I would shift the yellow directly into something that was more like purple or blue. Oh, right, 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 because I came from the grave and my eyes are red, so you just kind of assume that I'm... <laughs> Score is hugely important in this in this series. Um, we scored virtually every second of the show, and it's all original. All right, no, well, no, you have to hit consecutive punches. Lights. Elon is especially awesome because he's a huge Zelda fan to the point that like he knows all the Zelda games inside and out. I first saw The Legend of Neil when it came. I saw it on YouTube when the first episode, when it was just a single episode, just came out. The nice thing about Elon with the music is, is that he was able to do any style. There was never really a limitation. I don't think we ever really said, don't do classical music because that's just not his strength to don't do rock. Like, he could do anything. Parodies were so blatant. It's like, you have to be on the nose. But the challenge was to make it seem like it was still the legend of Neil. My process is I'm at the keyboard and I'm waiting and I just kind of improvise against the picture. I mean, we might try one too where he likes us. He's like playing with her hair and then like reaches over to you and like, or something like that. Sandeep as a director is a lot of fun to work with because he, he brings a lot of playfulness to every scene. He, he thinks of things to improvise for every character within each scene. He has a really good way of talking to the actors and getting what he wants out of them. I, I always appreciate how much he would let us go. You're gonna use the best of what you get and you're going, you're just, your chances- And take are, credit for it. And take credit for it, which is important. His patience, as an AD, I'm saying his name literally hundreds of times a day and he never was like, what? I've edited with Sandeep in New York, San Francisco, and LA. It's some post house in San Francisco I was working out of, and he drives up to spend the weekend with his brother. I mean, there's like a, a certain dedication there that's amazing. When he says you're funny, to me, it's a giant compliment because I think so highly of him. I love you, okay? I love you. I feel good. And then start motioning like. People look to that series to say, how do I make a web series? How do I make it watchable? How do I please an audience on the internet that's a new audience that wants different things from a traditional TV audience? It does all these things that no other web series did. There were stunts, visual effects, makeup, costumes, crazy sets. Like, you just don't see that stuff on the web. Lands that have not been seen. It's an entire universe that we had to create. And the complexity of some of the shots with the, the wardrobe, the concept, the visual effects, the sound design, it's mind-boggling that uh, those guys actually pulled it off. To do what we did on time and on budget and create something that was so funny. It's inspiring to watch this little seedling that started in someone's house turn into such uh, a great thing. From the early days of bringing all the food from everybody and, and, and helping to pay for the pilot we were shooting to the finale screening we had with a lot of cast and crew and fans. and You, know, you see the numbers online. You see these numbers growing, and you see that you have views, but to actually get to meet the people who are watching it is 
such an amazing feeling. Obviously, Legend of Neil hit the perfect nerve for that fan base. These are people who clearly love The Legend of Zelda as much as I do. All the friend requests I got on Facebook, that was <laughs> lots of people wanted to be friends with the old man. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I think uh, that's just the right amount of douche in my face. It's very cool to see people dressing up, not as Link from Zelda, but as Neil. They're dressed up based on a makeup I did. That's crazy. The level of pride goes up in me because it's like, yeah, we affected all these people's lives. I never looked forward to working on a show more than I look forward to Neil. I'll show it to my kids when they're old enough to watch me uh, asphyxiate myself. We made a fucking funny, crass, nasty, silly, adventure, fantasy show. And I'm just, yeah, crazy proud of it. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching that video from F and Funny. Click here to watch another video or click here to subscribe. Or click nowhere and just let YouTube's algorithm whisk you away to some mysterious surprise. But let's be honest, it'll probably be like some alt-right video about how brown people shouldn't go to Applebee's, so safe for bet to click our stuff.